are already yours. Not because you work for it, not because you feel bad about the bad things you did, not because you try hard. You have been given grace and mercy and peace from Jesus. He gives it to you as a gift. And so it's yours. Amen. So the Bible calls conversion death. It says that when you become Christian, it's not like you sat down at a menu and decided, yeah, I think I'll have the cheese pizza with a side of Christianity. That, that's not how it worked. That when someone becomes Christian, it's not a matter of a good person trying to be better or a bad person trying to be good. The Bible says that when someone becomes Christian, it is death. And I think maybe some of you can understand that. Maybe some of you have very dramatic stories of how you became Christian. But whether you remember the moment you became Christian or not, you get this. We started worship with pain today. And I'm not talking about the opening hymn. We started today with pain because we admitted, we said all together, I'm sinful. If you take that seriously, it hurts. It means saying, I'm wrong. Guys, especially, how many of you love making U-turns when you're going the wrong way down the road? Anyone? Yeah. I hate making U-turns. I hate admitting I will drive five miles around to make it look like I didn't make a U-turn. I hate admitting I'm wrong about something as little as that, much less that I'm so evil, that I am so sinful, that I've done so many things wrong, that I deserve death. See, the Christian life is filled with suffering, and it always has been. The very early Christians understood that in a very, very real way. Jesus died. He was executed on a cross. Then he rose from the dead, and 40 days later, he went back up to heaven. And his followers started talking about him. They shared him all over. But the same people that had Jesus killed were still in charge. And they didn't like this. And so they started hunting Christians down. And one of the people that was most involved in that was a man by the name of Saul. Now Saul had grown up learning from the greatest rabbi of his time, a guy by the name of Gamaliel. And Saul sat and he listened to everything that Gamaliel said. Ah, oh, Saul, tell me, what are you supposed to be doing? And Saul answered, be holy, like the Lord my God is holy. That's right, Saul. Be holy, like the Lord your God is holy. That means you will love the Lord your God with all your strength and with all your heart and with all your mind and, and I'll love my neighbor as myself. That's right, Saul. And all his life, that's what Saul wanted to be. Holy, perfect, stepping away from anything that was filthy or impure. And that's one of the reasons why he hated Jesus. Here was Jesus. Great teacher, right? Except he hang out, he hang out, he hung out with people that were impure. He hung out with tax collectors, with thieves, with prostitutes. How dare he do something like that and claim to be teaching for God? And then on top of that, he's not paying attention to God's rules. God said, rest on the Sabbath. And here's Jesus healing people. God said, wash, and Jesus doesn't seem to care about these things. And so when Jesus was executed, Saul approved. But his followers said that Jesus was alive again three days later. And this vermin, these heretics, started sharing Jesus everywhere they went, and his following exploded. Saul couldn't stand it. One day Saul was in the capital city in Jerusalem and he heard a, a tumult, a, a, a lot of people shouting and he ran to see what was going on 
And there was a man bloody on the ground and a crowd around them hurling rocks at him. So I asked, what's going on? And one of them says, oh, that's Stephen. He's a follower of the way. You know, those people that followed Jesus, they weren't called Christians yet. You were just a follower of the way. It's one of the followers of the way. We're killing him. Saul nods and says, yes, this is what we should be doing. And so that's what Saul did. He started going from home to home looking for followers of the way. Anyone who said Jesus was God, anyone who thought that you didn't have to be holy like the Lord your God was holy, and he captured them. And if they died, oh well, darn. But then Saul learned that their, their poison was spreading that there were Christians, that there were these followers of the way up in Damascus. And so Saul goes to the high priest. I heard that they're there. Let me go. Give me letters to the rabbis there so that I've got permission to gather up anyone there that follows this Jesus, and I'll bring him back here. And the high priest signed off on it. And so Saul went. Damascus was 130 miles away. Five days' journey through the wilderness, through the desert. And every morning, Saul woke up, and he couldn't wait to get there. Five days. Finally gets to day five, and Saul is eager to set out that morning. He can't wait to get to Damascus and get to work. And as he's walking, there's a light. Now, some of y'all are from Arizona. You understand what a bright sun is. Those of us here in Kentucky, um, yep, some of us are from Ohio here, um, we know what the sun is. Can you imagine how bright a light would have to be if you're walking through that desert sun and now there's another light and it's powerful enough to drive you to your knees? How much brighter that would have to be if you're already used to that? Suddenly there's a light and Saul can't even stand up under it. And it's not just a physical light. It's not just a light that, that brightened his eyes, but it seemed to go right through him, right through his heart, and reveal all the dirty things that he thought he didn't have. All the filth. Be holy like I, the Lord your God, am holy. And suddenly he knew what that meant. Because this light was holy, and he wasn't. And then the light speaks, Saul, Saul. And now it's even worse, because now the light knows its name. It's not just like it's a random light, oh, oh, this is bad. But it's looking right at him. Saul, why are you persecuting me? Persecuting. He's being holy. He's hunting down the people that aren't holy. He's doing the best he can. And he asks, who are you? And the light answers, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you thought you were doing the right thing, and you found out you were wrong, and that person over there has every right to be angry at you? It's not a good feeling. It happened to me yesterday. Um, I came here. I practiced the sermon like I usually do on a Saturday morning. And one of our members came through the door. Pastor, weren't you up for mowing the lawn last week? Yeah? You didn't do it, did you? No. <laughs> he had every right to be angry at me. I felt about this tall. And that was something as little as mowing the lawn. Can you imagine then if it's God saying that to you? That God has come to you and he's angry at you and he has every right to be angry at you. Saul wept. His face was in the dirt and he couldn't hold back the sobs. And like that, the light was gone. 
Saul had been traveling with some other men. They came and helped him up. And when Saul finally opened his eyes, he couldn't see. He had come as a conqueror, and now he couldn't even find his way. He had come to bind people and take them to Jerusalem, and now he had to be led by the hand to get into Damascus. He was taken to the house he was supposed to stay with, and he couldn't even eat, and he couldn't even drink. Now, there was another guy who lived in Damascus. His name was Ananias. Ananias was a follower of the way. He, he worshipped Jesus as God. He trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. And as soon as he heard that Saul was coming, Ananias prayed. He prayed with everything that was in him. Lord, help. This man is coming to take me away. He's coming to take my kids away. Come. Don't let him do this. And then the word came that Saul had arrived and he was blind. Can you imagine that relief? We're safe. And those prayers for deliverance turned to prayers for thanksgiving. And for three days, Ananias prayed, Thank you, Lord. Thank you for safety. Thank you for, for saving my brothers and sisters. And then God came to Ananias and says, Ananias. And Ananias goes, Yeah? And God says, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he's praying. In a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. And Ananias says, um, hold on a second here. <laughs> you just freed us from him. You just delivered us from him. And now you want me to go and heal him so that he can come and arrest me and my kids, my wife? That's what you want me to do? And God answers, go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings. And before the people of Israel, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Saul was not going to suffer his payment. God already said, you're going to go heal him. Saul was not going to suffer as punishment. God could have done that. There was that light there. He could have just gone, and Saul would have been dead. But he didn't. God showed mercy. But now this was going to be a consequence. The people who hate Jesus are the people who are going to hate those who follow Jesus. Saul's going to follow Jesus now. Jesus has called him to faith. And now there's going to be consequences of that. I can't claim to fully understand what went through Ananias' heart. I don't think I would have been able to do this. But he got up and he went. And he found Saul. And this was no longer any mighty conqueror. Three days without eating, three days without drinking. Saul was a hollow skeleton of a man. And Ananias put his hand on Saul's head. And he starts by saying, brother. Can you imagine that? saying brother to someone that you were so scared of because he had every chance to take you away? Brother Saul, the Lord, and that Lord is Jesus. Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And at that moment, something like scales fell out of Saul's eyes. He could see. And the first thing he did, he was baptized. He joined the people that he was trying to destroy. He was adopted into God's family and he learned something. Be holy 
like I, the Lord your God, am holy. That wasn't him. He wasn't good enough. And that's why Jesus came. Saul would later write, For God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness or the holiness of God. Saul was holy now. Not because of what he did, but because of what Jesus did. Not because he deserved it, but because he got what Jesus deserved. And from that day on, he praised Jesus with everything he had. But his suffering had just begun. We're going to look at his suffering in the coming weeks, but for today, every Christian suffers like Saul did here. We admit our sin, and that hurts. When we look in and we're honest, it hurts. Because we start realizing, look at all the things we've done wrong. And we try to put on medicine. We try to put on a little Band-Aid. Well, you know what? I was just doing what I had to do. I was trying to do the right thing. I didn't know any better. Anytime you make an excuse, anytime you try to cast blame, that's all you're doing. You're trying to put a Band-Aid on something that has ripped you in half. It ain't going to help. The only healing is Jesus. As he comes to you and says, nope, you are that bad. And I love you that much. You are that sinful. And you are that forgiven. And that pain turns to healing. As Jesus takes you in his nail-scarred arms and says, you belong with me. So yeah, there is suffering. But there's so much healing as Jesus forgives even sinners like us. Amen. Let's stand. And now the peace of God that is better than anything we can understand will keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord until he returns